Hello and welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2021 New York City election season is underway and it's poised to be the most significant municipal election in decades. All of city government is on the ballot and because so few incumbents are eligible to run for their current seats due to term limits, New Yorkers are electing many new office holders and the next roster of leadership for our city. There will be a new mayor of New York City elected here in 2021, as well as a new city controller, new borough presidents, many new city council members, and that's not all that's on the ballot. There's also another very important election happening in the city, specifically in Manhattan, but not for a city government position. There's a very crowded and competitive race for Manhattan district attorney, the top prosecutor, the top law enforcement official of New York County, otherwise known as Manhattan. A position of immense power and importance, the office holder makes key decisions that impact the lives of many New Yorkers and millions who don't live in the borough or even the city. Millions of people who call Manhattan home, work there, or just visit the borough. Decisions of life and death, freedom and incarceration, crime and punishment. This is one of the most high profile and important criminal justice jobs in the country. It's technically a state level position, so there are slightly different election rules at play. For example, there are no term limits for the Manhattan District Attorney. Candidates for the office have very different campaign finance rules. And although ranked choice voting is starting this year for city government positions in special and primary elections, ranked choice voting is not at play in the Manhattan District Attorney primary. But the election for Manhattan DA is happening this year at the same time as all the city government elections with a June primary and a fall general election. Got it all? <laughs> so it's okay if not. The most important thing is that you know the primary is coming up in June and it's time to get to know the candidates. So we're pleased to bring you this new series of interviews with the candidates running for Manhattan District Attorney, as well as candidates for other offices, including mayor. These one-on-one -on -one conversations will help you get to know the candidates, learn about their backgrounds and platforms, where they stand on key issues, and what kind of district attorney they're promising to be if elected in the borough of Manhattan. We hope this and other interviews will help you sort through your choices and make an informed decision when it's time to vote. So today's interview, joining me by Zoom now is Tali Farhadian Weinstein, a Democratic candidate for Manhattan District Attorney. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Ben, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for joining me. So why don't you go ahead and take a, a couple minutes, you know, broad overview who you are, uh, where you come from, what brings you to this race? Great. Thank you. So um, I'd love to tell you a bit about where I'm from and where I'd like to go. And, you know, I always start by describing myself as an immigrant. I came to the U.S. as a kid on Christmas Eve of 1979 with my mom and my brother. We were fleeing the violence and the anti-Semitism and the chaos, really, of revolutionary Iran. And we came here to seek asylum. And ultimately, uh, we were able to get amnesty uh, about a decade later, uh, helped along the whole way with the help of pro bono lawyers from the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. And, you know, I, I start there and in that moment, Ben, because for me, you know, the longer I go on in my career, the more I understand uh, that that is my framework for how I look at the work that I've tried to do uh, and what I actually want to accomplish as Manhattan DA, by which I mean I never take fairness and safety for granted. I know that that's why I'm here. Uh, I know that's why my parents brought me here. And like many immigrants, I can imagine what my life would have looked like if I had not gotten to be an American. And it also means that when I see barriers to access or to opportunity, whether they are ones that I've experienced myself or that I could never experience, I think I have that immigrant's impulse to try to tear them down. And I, I with that framework, I went on to work across many American legal institutions. Um, I'm actually really happy to be able to say now that I got to work for three attorneys general of the United States. My first job was with Judge Merrick Garland. I was his law clerk right out of law school. He really taught me how to be a lawyer. Uh, then I went on after working for Sandra Day O'Connor at the Supreme Court 
to work for Eric Holder when he was the attorney general. I was one of his counsel. Then Loretta Lynch hired me and I became a federal prosecutor for six years here in New York where I did every manner of case from gun violence to public corruption to tax evasion to national security matters. And then my last stop was in the Brooklyn DA's office working for Eric Gonzalez. I was part of his leadership team and his general counsel helping him put into motion his vision for criminal justice reform. And it's really where I got to reflect on what are the cases we ought to be bringing as local prosecutors, and what are the ones that we should not? And I hope we'll get to dig into some of that together. Well, I have other other questions for you, but since you mentioned that, and that's somewhere we were going to get to, why don't you go ahead on that? I mean, you know, that's one of the biggest uh, questions of this race. It's one of the biggest questions facing prosecutors at all levels, uh, in all boroughs, uh, everywhere in New York State, New York City, and across the country. So what's your philosophy on that? It is. And look, that Ben, that's really the heart of the job because we have so much discretion and you're never going to find a prosecutor anywhere in the country who is enforcing every single law against every single person who breaks that law every single time and in the same manner. And that's... That's the challenge of this job is, I think, to use our resources, our limited resources, to really protect the most vulnerable and to bring the cases that advance public safety. And, you know, just to give you a sense of scale, the Manhattan DA's office now is bringing about 50,000 cases a year. Um, Brooklyn, uh, where I just was, a little bit more. And uh, there, there are so many choices to be made in what ought to go into that pot. And so, uh, you know, for me, as I said, I would start with who are the most vulnerable? Who are the people who we ought to be looking out for, who really need force and law to come out on their side? And so I'm thinking about the victims of gun violence. As you know, Ben, shootings uh, were up dramatically last year across New York City. Thinking about the victims of gender-based violence like domestic violence and sexual assault. And I'm also thinking about pulling back from criminal responses to cases like public health issues that are really best dealt with in a different way. And then our role becomes either to stand down or to divert some of those cases um, through you know, early points in the criminal process to somebody else. So it's either about declination or diversion. What's, a, what's an example of, or one or two examples of public health issues that you think are best done uh, in those other venues, whether it's you know, declining to prosecute or diversion? Uh, so there are so many things to choose from because there are there is so much diversity uh, in declination and diversion policy. So I'll just give you some examples that really come out of what I saw was successful in Brooklyn. Uh, so for folks who are chemically addicted in Brooklyn um, and were found to be in um, misdemeanor possession of drugs with we had a program uh, called Clear where they could be they could choose right away, uh, right after arraignment, to be diverted into treatment uh, rather than to go into the criminal justice process. And then, way different, you know, in a different part of the spectrum, uh, the Brooklyn DA's office also has what I think is a terrific program for diversion for gun possession cases. So uh, a, m a more serious offense but uh, a program that whose early results are really great in having lower recidivism for young people, usually young men, found to be in possession of a gun with no criminal history, they could, after going through a tailor-made diversion program that it would involve job training, mental health treatment, education, could have the charges dismissed and not, you know, not wind up going into prison, but actually come back to their communities. And I think the through line in all of this, Ben, is we have to have the humility to try these things, and then we also have to measure the results, and we have to continue with what works to advance public safety uh, and redirect You know, if something isn't working. So since we're on the topic, um, let's stick with it. You mentioned victims of gun violence. You mentioned the significant increase in shootings and murders that happened in New York City yeah. in 2020. What does the Manhattan District Attorney do about that? Uh, there are there is a big difference as you just got at between many gun possession cases and actual cases of shootings and murders, which are a lot harder to solve. Often, uh, talk a little bit about your sort of what your approach would be to mm -hmm. trying to both reduce gun violence, you know, before it happens, and and prosecute gun violence. 
Yeah, and, and I appreciate the way you formulated the question, Ben, because it already kind of has the answer in it, uh, and I think reflects the way that I've tried to talk about this in my plan for gun violence, which is we have to be thoughtful and we have to know uh, where to be really aggressive, where to be creative, where to try new tools. Uh, so look, we have to start with gun trafficking. We live in, thankfully, in a blue state and a blue city, and so, uh, you know, for a gun to be here probably means that it's here unlawfully, and so we have to stem the flow. And I, you know, I would bring my experience both doing the cases, you know, in the federal system, but generally understanding how to work together with other jurisdictions uh, to to make sure that these guns are not coming into New York in the first place, right? Uh, that that that's our best sort of assault. I think there are also other areas where we need to be prosecuting aggressively. Things like the purchase of ghost guns, which are guns that you could buy in parts um, on the internet. And you don't like have to have a PhD in engineering to put them together, like three or four parts. Uh, and so they're not regulated as guns uh, by the federal government. Um, you know, it's, it's a problem, it's a loophole. Um, guns out, you know, getting guns out of the hands of domestic abusers, uh, you know, really to, to take the tools that we already do have and to say, this has to be our first priority. The die is not cast. We can change the course of this kind of violence. Uh, and that also to be supportive of community programs uh, and communities that are trying to cure violence to change the, you know, to change the cycle uh, early on. And um, it's, I don't think we have to choose or could possibly choose between one or the other. Right? There's um, some significant, you know, small relative, of course, to the, the overall population in New York City, but there's some significant group of people who do, you know, commit shootings, do kill people uh, every year, uh, every month, every day. What needs to happen to, you know, individuals when you're the Manhattan District Attorney who are the, the perpetrators of gun violence? Are you um, you know, how are you thinking about who really needs to go to jail for long periods of time and who doesn't? Yeah. Um, so uh, there you're talking about drivers of crime. And it, it that is right that, you know, across many kinds of crimes, it's sort of been recorded that often the same people are responsible for a disproportionate amount of the violence. And we you know we have to be smart about in investigating and finding them. Uh, and I do think that, you know, they should be held to account and uh, and the ordinary sort of processes that we use for prosecution, for investigation, for coming, you know, to, to sort of figuring out like what is the enterprise that is responsible at the highest level for this violence happening in our city has to be a starting point. So let's zoom back out. We, we got into some of that because uh, you mentioned the gun violence, you mentioned uh, prosecutorial discretion, and, and hopefully we'll come back to some of that again. But let's talk a little bit more about your sort of philosophy of you're running this office. It's a very big office, well over a thousand employees, hundreds of attorneys, other staff, uh, 120 plus million dollar budget every year, plus hundreds of millions of dollars in, in settlement money that can be used by the office. Talk about how your experience in management, please, and, and, and what that would lead you to do as district attorney in terms of managing, running, organizing such a big office. Yes. And so, uh, you know, I, I didn't just help Attorney General Holder manage, you know, su support him in managing the Department of Justice or manage my own cases. I feel really ready for this job because I was a part of the leadership team in Brooklyn uh, and had a significant management role. So I, um, I managed components of the office, some of the biggest components of the office, including our appeals bureau, where we took our legal positions. I created and went on to supervise the Post-Conviction Justice Bureau, which I think is the first of its kind in the country to really think about prosecutors' responsibility and role at the back end in doing justice. I helped to supervise and create the Law Enforcement Accountability Bureau. I developed policies that apply to all ADAs. I uh, was the ethics advisor for all ADAs in Brooklyn. And um, I, I draw a lot of things from that. You know, part of what I saw work, just to bring your focus to one thing, Ben, uh, which was a management tool that DA Gonzalez, um, I thought used really effectively, was to to change the defaults in how we use our discretion. Um, and so, you know, I don't take credit for this. He had this idea and we, you know, helped support him in when, before bail reform in New York, we wanted to reduce our pretrial 
detention population. Uh, and so he issued new guidance to ADAs that said, well, you still have discretion to ask for money bail in misdemeanor cases, but now you have to write it up. In, and the leadership team of the office is going to review your write-ups every evening. And we dramatically reduced our pretrial detention population through that tool. And so when I created the Post-Conviction Justice Bureau, and we wanted to rethink our approach to parole and not to be reflexively opposed to parole, which is traditionally what prosecutors have done, uh, we made it a new rule that in cases that had ended in a guilty plea, which is like almost every case, as you know, that the default would be that you should support parole because you made a bargain with the incarcerated person, you, meaning the office. I mean, it's unlikely that it was the same ADA, that the minimum sentence could be enough. And if you wanted to oppose parole, you could, but you'd have to put it in writing and explain it to a supervisor and have a supervisor sign off. And so, you know, I think we have the tools and drawing from those experience, I think the most important thing is to teach and to train on how to use discretion properly and to monitor it and to supervise it, you know, not just put these policies out, but to actually make sure that they are living and breathing. That gets at a really interesting question, which is, has there been something really culturally broken at these district attorney offices and other prosecutorial offices? Do you think there's something really fundamentally off right now in the Manhattan District Attorney Office that you would need a big culture change there? When I was coming up through the federal system, you know, I was always taught that a, a prosecution is a search for truth. And I think that if you it, you know, it's, it's obviously also about accountability and justice. But if you think about what you're trying to do is get to the truth of what happened, I think it really changes your approach. You know, we have an adversarial system, but that doesn't mean that everything is, is sort of a duel. I definitely don't think that we should be measuring success on conviction rates. Uh, I think it's about, you know, ultimately, are people safer than they were before? Are communities safer than they were before? And sometimes that that's done by working with our, you know, so-called adversaries. Um, I'll, I'll give you another example. When the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act went into effect, which allowed people who had themselves experienced domestic violence and then had been convicted of crimes to be resentenced because of the effect of the violence on their own culpability, we set up a process in Brooklyn to work with defense counsel to identify the, the most urgent cases and to bring them to the court on consent. Right. Um, so I, I think because we were trying to get to the truth of of what had happened and what would be a just result in some of these cases. So uh, you use the word culture. Um, I, I think it's, it's a culture. It's also just it's an ethic of what you're trying to accomplish in this job. In your sense of the current Manhattan District Attorney Office, do you you know, see this as a situation where you would need to come in and, you know, sort of clean house of the of of a lot of leadership and, and ADAs, or do you think it's it's more about sort of tweaking, um, you know, tweaking what's there, but putting your imprint on it? You know, how are you thinking about, you know, what, what yeah. that would look well, like? So, uh, Ben, you know, I think I have the benefit of being both an insider and an outsider. I've never worked in the Manhattan DA's office. And on the other hand, I know how it works from having worked at the leadership level uh, just across the river in, in a similar office. And I, I I'd have to get in there and see who is doing what, but I think the best practice is to re-interview everybody who works in these places. You know, I've always thought, and I would say this about myself as well, nobody is entitled to these jobs. The people are entitled to have the best people do this work. And I also think that people um, are, are responsive to good leadership that uh, pulls them and pushes them to do their job differently or to do their jobs, you know, connected to the kinds of values that you and I have been talking about today. Will you speak a little bit more about what your approach to things like plea bargaining, uh, the so-called trial penalty that um, often accompanies a refusal to take a plea um, and sentencing? Well, look, uh, you know, I think that there, it is reasonable for there to be some small difference between the 
the sentence you get after a trial versus if you plead guilty because of the small benefit to the people to um, not using the resources. I mean, we actually had a, a number on it in our federal sentencing chart where I grew up. I think trial penalties, though, are deeply offensive and, and unjust. I'm going to give you, you know, a story, Ben, if you'll allow me, that I think really is, is an answer to everything you've just asked me about. So when we started the Post-Conviction Justice Bureau in Brooklyn, we invited people to ask our office to support them in clemency or parole applications. And I came across the case of a man named Derek Holland. I wound up talking to his daughter on my podcast, who had been convicted in 1994 of three robberies that he had done in the course of a week while he was addicted to crack cocaine and while he was homeless. And he stole about $100 worth of stuff. And the DA's office offered him six years if he were to plead guilty to these crimes. And he said, no, I want to go to trial. So. He went to trial and he was sentenced, the office asked for, and he got a sentence of 32 and a half to 65 years. I mean, it just takes your breath away, right? And uh, we were able to support his parole application when he came up for parole after 25 years, which is something, but obviously not good enough. I mean, that sentence on its face, I think, is grossly excessive, not necessary for public safety. And, you know, he even had just to say, he even had letters in his file from his victims saying, look, I wanted him to be held accountable, but I can't sleep at night knowing that he is still incarcerated for this. And so, you know, I think that's, it, that it's a good object lesson for us of the things that went wrong. You know, that, that trial penalty to me is just horrible. I think plea bargaining is to be fair. I'm glad that there have been changes in discovery laws so that defendants can can go through the plea bargaining process actually knowing what the evidence is against them, you know, not bargaining in the dark. And one of the things that I'm really interested in doing, I mean, this will require some tech support, uh, is, is trying to keep track of why there are so many disparities in plea bargaining, because I think that has been one of the least transparent parts of the prosecution system. And it's also, as, as you know, over 95% of cases across the country in every kind of prosecutor's office are ending in plea convictions. So I, I, I would like to know more about why um, two people accused of the same crime, uh, even in the same office, often wind up with very different plea deals. And I think that that's something that we can, we can track. This, a lot of this gets, again, back to how you run the office and, you know, folks often, I don't think, you know, really think about the fact that the district attorney, it, it's so much about setting policy on a sort of day-to-day -day basis of what the assistant district attorneys are doing um, and how, you know, the, the people that lead the bureaus are running those bureaus. So what would you judge, you know, what would, what would, would there be metrics uh, for how you would judge the performance of those under you? Because, you know, what we're getting at here with, with plea bargaining and the trial penalty and things like that is that, um, you know, very often there are sort of metrics at play that uh, attorneys want to meet. Yes. And, and look, any, any institution uh, of this size, whether a government institution or not, it needs metrics. It needs performance evaluations. Um, and then particularly so when ultimately you're answering to the pub public, right? Uh, and people deserve to know uh, if, if ADAs are doing a good job on their behalf or not. And so, you know, there really is a movement around the country among progressive prosecutors to think about evaluations differently. We put in Brooklyn a new evaluation system into motion. There are other models that Fair and Just Prosecution and others have put out there that get away from measuring success on conviction rates and instead measure the quality of your work right? Did, did you write good motions? Uh, the quality of how you interacted with victims, with defendants, with witnesses, were you respectful? Were you fair? Uh, and and so on, right? To, and, and it's harder. It also requires supervisors to really know the people that they're supervising. So I think it has a secondary benefit of making sure that there is that kind of engagement. Uh, because, you know, I think, Ben, we also want to ultimately create a culture where people who have these enormous responsibility, right, and are often very young, are not afraid to come forward and to say, you know, I'm actually not sure what to do here. I don't know what the legal thing to do here is. I don't know what the right thing to do is here. Here are the things that I'm concerned about. Uh, and, and to be able to work it out before a mistake happens. 
And we just have a, a few more minutes. So I want to try to get to a couple other things. One of those is, you know, things that people often refer to as, as quote unquote, white collar crime, fraud, corruption, money laundering. Uh, how are you thinking about that? Does the Manhattan District Attorney's Office need to be more aggressive um, on white collar crime? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, uh, Bob Morgenthau uh, was the one who said it best that the responsibility of this office is to prosecute from the streets to the suites. So I think it's very much in the heart of what we're supposed to be doing. And what I'll tell you about those crimes, white collar crimes, economic crimes, just from my own experience having done them as a federal prosecutor, is that it, they just require something very different. You're not reacting, you know, to a, a shooting in the street and then working your way backwards. You you also have to really know how to investigate. And as you said yourself, uh, these offices are populated, you know, not just by uh, lawyers but also by other kinds of staff, including our, our own investigative forces. And I think it's really important to do agenda setting with them and to take the time to train and to develop. I mean, I, I had worked on cases when I was a federal prosecutor that required years of investigation uh, and just a very different uh, skill set in, in knowing how what to look for and how to put it together. Um, and I very much would like to make that a robust part of the Manhattan DA's office. Do you have a sense of which areas under this umbrella really need more attention? Uh, you know, I think that it's, uh, some of the places that it, it's interesting because in different, we have a lot of prosecutors running around, you know, we have the Southern District is here and the Eastern District and two um, prosecutor, local prosecutors off sitting up against each other and other enforcement agencies. And sometimes they sort of compete for cases or will fill in gaps with each other. But I think really anytime somebody cheats or steals from New Yorkers, um, that's within our purview. I think that um, in the areas of things like wage theft, in construction fraud. Um, th those are the kinds of cases that these offices um, have had some success in and I think can expand on. Um, it, elder fraud is something that I'm thinking about a lot. I'm hearing a lot, Ben, uh, when I talk to seniors now that one of the terrible symptoms of the pandemic has been uh, you know, a world of people trying to take advantage of seniors through various kinds of scams on their phones, on the internet, where they're spending all of their time and people are vulnerable, right? They're, they're lonely and then they're getting these calls, I have a cure for the vaccine for you if you'll just give me X, Y, Z. Uh, so there, there's, a, there's a lot to do. And uh, in, our, in our last minute or so here, I wanted to get your sense, you know, from what you've seen so far, do you think that criminal charges from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office are warranted towards Donald Trump when he uh, is a private citizen? So uh, I, I'm going to disappoint you with how little I can say, but I do think it is important to say that what, what we need to have in, you know, in a leadership role like this is a person who will follow the facts wherever they may lead and will both know how to deal with the complexity of a case like that, what may turn out to be the most important local prosecution in American history that will require understanding the constitutional law, the touch points between federal and state jurisdiction, you know, all of that. And I would also hope, you know, the courage to make good choices. Uh, but we seem to be in the first inning, right? I mean, I've read the same media you've read about some of his business and tax practices. Um, we also know that uh, he still hasn't turned over the documents that the current Manhattan DA has been seeking for a really long time. So um, I, 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 I can't prejudge, uh, but I, if I had to guess, I would say that there's going to be um, an enormous responsibility and challenge for the next occupant of this office. Uh, I'm and not disappointed. That's along the line. <laughs> What I expected you to say. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> lastly, in just um, just a couple words, I just wanted to ask if there's a current or former prosecutor who you hold up as your role model. Uh, not necessarily the exact same philosophy or approach, but someone you really see as a as a role model. You know, that's an easy question for me because I I really have had the good fortune of having worked with so many prosecutors who I think have really tried to push to deliver on fairness and safety. And so obviously, Eric Gonzalez, um, who uh, I spent the last couple of years working with, Eric Holder, Loretta Lynch, Merrick Garland. I mean, I've said all the <laughs> names to you and and. Um, and and I think you would agree. I hope that you would agree that that each has really 
broken new ground in his or her own way and has been a champion of justice. Very good. Tali Farhadian Weinstein is a Democratic candidate for Manhattan District Attorney. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much for having me, Ben. Have a great day. And thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions for New York City voters are coming up in June and the fall. There's a lot on the line for all of us and the future of this city. I hope this conversation was helpful to you. I'm Ben Max. See you next time. Thank you.